My name is Charmaine Begg, and I would like to welcome you to the Aga Khan Museum. I'm here, I'm the lead educator here at the museum, and I'm really pleased to welcome you this afternoon. Thank you for your patience, uh, but we have a real treat for us today. Uh, we will hear from Dr. Jewett, Judith Cohen, who will be discussing the music of Moroccan Jews from ballads of long ago kings and queens to the wedding songs of everyday people. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge this land on which the Aga Khan Museum stands, known as Takaronto, and honor the stewardship, past, present, and future, of the Huron Wendat, the Iroquois Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe, and most recently, the Misagas of the Credit. Dr. Judith Cohen is an ethnomusicologist, singer, and storyteller. Originally from Montreal, she has taught for many years at York University and divides her non-teaching time between Canada, Spain, Portugal, Morocco, and wherever she goes to for research, conferences, concerts, fieldwork, and curiosity. A specialist in Sephardic music and music among the crypto Jews of Portugal, she also works with Balkan, Franco-Canadian, Yiddish, and other traditions. She is a consultant for the Spain collection of preeminent American ethnomusicologist, Alan Lomax. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Judith Cohen. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, so welcome, all of you. Uh, as you can see, this is a presentation about the songs of mostly women, mostly Moroccan Sephardic women. And uh, most of it is from my own field collection, partly in Morocco, partly in Montreal, where many of them live. And I did my dissertation field research, some in Israel, some in France, some in uh, where else? Venezuela. And uh, we'll just go right into it. So most of the words are at the beginning. As we go on, it's going to be more pictures and more music and fewer words. But I just wanted you to be able to more or less follow what I'm saying. So since the 1980s and the 1990s, I've worked with Sephardic Jewish music from Morocco, Turkey, and the Balkans in many countries. So today we're going to talk mostly about Morocco. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, you could still find a lot of Moroccan Jewish women from Tangier, Tetuan, Ksar al-Kibir, El Araish, and Arzila. So this is the north of Morocco, and it's really the, the northwest part of the country that for a little over half the 20th century, from I think 1912 to some, sometime in the 60s, was under a Spanish protectorate. So the rest of Morocco at the time was still kind of French colonialism, which ended in the late 40s, but the Spanish protectorate uh, continued a little while longer. And so what happened was they already spoke a very old form of Castilian and other peninsular languages from when they went to Morocco as a refuge after the Inquisition in 1492. And then they acquired Spanish again during the Spanish protectorate. So some of them modernized their Spanish, some of them learned new melodies, and really what happened was it was a mixture of what they'd kept going for several centuries since the beginning of the Inquisition and the expulsion from Spain, and what they were learning over, over the radio, the brand new radio, and teachers in the schools of the Spanish protectorate and so on. So it was a very interesting, dynamic time. Um, for the most part, this was the generation who sang the old narrative ballads that we'll talk about in here, the romances and the wedding songs, as part of their daily lives. Uh, these two Canadian cities, Montreal and Toronto, also became home to a much smaller number of Sephardic Jews, Sephardim, from the former, former Ottoman zones that are <coughs> today's Greece, Bosnia, Herzegovina, <coughs> sorry, Turkey, Bulgaria, former Yugoslavia, Israel, and others. There's just a few thousand Jews remaining in Morocco today, out of hundreds of thousands who lived there for two millennia. Most of them have moved to Israel, French Canada, where they can, of course, speak French, uh, France, Venezuela, and elsewhere. The king of Morocco, the current king, goes out of his way to ensure that the Jews who live there and those who visit are respected. And his chief advisor, whom you see down at the bottom here, his chief advisor, André Zoulay, he was advisor to this king's uh, father before him, and he has done a tremendous amount, and he does, including today, a tremendous amount to build bridges between communities and, and ensure that there's a lot of mutual respect. Um, I myself was invited to sing Moroccan Jewish women's songs at a small festival some years ago, and that's what the other, that's the rest of the picture. I was invited by the man on the 
lower left, Mohamed Labi, and I sang together with uh, Zara Bonani, who's the bottom right. So as you can see, there's a lot of really great bridge building and bridge maintaining going on. Uh, Sephardic Judeo-Spanish songs, and I'm using the word Judeo-Spanish kind of loosely, we call it all kinds of things. It's the umbrella term, so the language is known by different names. People often say Ladino today, though technically Ladino is only for word-to-word -word translations from Hebrew, but you can use it, it's fine. Um, in Morocco, they call it Haketia. In the former Ottoman lands, you might hear Judesmo, Judeo, Espanol. So if I say Haketia or I say Moroccan, Judeo, Spanish, it's all the same thing. It's the form of Spanish that the Jews of northern Morocco speak. Uh, and these are the song genres. We're going to hear them, of course, but just to give you a general idea. So a romance, or romance in modern Spanish, is a narrative ballad, the kind of song that tells a story. You know, the king got up one morning, and he galloped onto his horse. He jumped on his horse and galloped away and, you know, killed some people with his sword and accomplished other things and went home to dinner. You know, that songs that tell a story. I don't think there's any about dinner, but, you know. Uh, life cycle songs, uh, most of them are actually wedding songs, but there are also songs for other parts of the life cycle, birth, uh, ritual circumcision for the boy at eight days, um, courtship, marriage, of course, the wedding songs, and songs, of course, for death, the end of life. And these are largely sung by women. Uh, calendar cycle songs, songs of the Jewish calendar year and the Sabbath, often in a mixture of Hebrew and Ladino, and they're sung by men and women, not always together. Uh, and not so much in Morocco, but in the other areas, in, in uh, the Ottoman areas, Turkey and the Balkans and Greece, they're general songs, kantikas, and these are lyric songs, love songs, topical parodies, social commentary, and so on. Um, more women than men, but really both, you know, and you don't hear them, as I said, as much in Morocco. And finally, newly composed songs with known composers, and these... People do all the time, but you don't really hear much of them because they're pretty ephemeral. Again, you find them much more in the Eastern Mediterranean tradition. So that's your general overview. And here are some of the people. So singing Moroccan, Judeo-Spanish in Montreal and Toronto, one of the big new contexts, so you know, the traditional context for a wedding song is a wedding, right? And the traditional context for a ballad is while you're taking care of the baby, or you're sewing, or you're mending, or you're shelling peas, or you're doing some other fairly monotonous task with your hands, that you can't play an instrument, but you can sing. And very, very often these long songs were done during that kind of context. But in Montreal, in the 80s, when I started my dissertation research, I quickly found that the most common new traditional context was the bingo game. And so the Club Sepharad d'Age d'Or, the, the Sephardic club, the Sephardic Golden Age club in Montreal met a couple of times a week. And on days like today with snow, they'd send a little van around to pick the women up and bring them home. And I heard many, many ballads actually sung in the club. I'll play you a couple of recordings of these later. And uh, just to put some names on these faces uh, and play with the laser pointer. <laughs> so up there you have, well, me when I was a lot younger. Uh, Jumol Ederi, who's the same woman here with the tambourine, uh, Lucy Kerub, Hannah Pimienta, who sang, I don't even know how many songs, many, many songs, Alegria Ben Amron, Clara Bentolila, Esther Hachuel. And this is here in Toronto, doesn't look like it, but this is a wedding that took place here in Toronto uh, around Bathurst and Shepherd. And uh, here's the bride. But normally, the bride would not be like this at a traditional wedding. Normally, the bride would be dressed by her women, her mother and her mother-in-law and her sisters and her women friends. And once she was all dressed, she would keep her eyes cast down very modestly, partly because the headdress weighed a ton, and you couldn't really lift your eyes anyway. But ritually speaking, because it would be very bad luck to see a man not of your, origin, of your family. I mean, if you saw your brother or your father, your brother-in-law, that would be fine, but in this kind of liminal time, this threshold time between the time when you're all dressed and ready to go and the time you actually receive the blessings. It's not that long, but it's a kind of dangerous threshold time. So you're not supposed to see any other man besides your husband-to-be. But these customs aren't really practiced anymore, and that's why you see the bride on her henna night here in Toronto, pretty happy and dancing away. and. Actually, I can tell you what had happened is that she was an orphan, and the community 
got together to give her a really beautiful wedding. And that's another tradition still in Morocco that if the bride is very poor and can't afford a beautiful dress, then the richest woman of the community loans her her absolutely most expensive, beautiful, hand-embroidered dress so that she can be the queen for, for the day of her wedding. And <clears throat> that's one of the dresses down here, her black velvet, embroidered velvet. <clears throat> that one was actually made by uh, Susie Benchimol that I was hoping would come today, but she said it was too far from her place in Thornhill and her husband couldn't drive her, so. But she actually makes them and she's one of the main experts in this. And this is my old Moroccan Sephardic group on the bottom right in Montreal. Jerry Neldo, after uh, a song, actually I can sing you the song because I'm talking a lot. It goes, Quien supiera tal fortuna para dar al rey vestido, como tuvo Jerry Neldo mañanita de domingo, limpiando paños de seda para dar al rey vestido, mirando está la infanta desde su alto castillo. So Jerry Neldo, in modern Spanish, Gerineldo, is the king's page, the most important page. And he's in love, or probably more precisely in lust, with the king's daughter, the princess. And she calls to him at midnight, just before midnight, and she calls down to him and says, hey, Gerineldo, you want to like come up? And he says, Como soy vuestro criado, señora, burlais conmigo. I'm just your servant. You're making fun of me. Yo no burlo, Gerinaldo, que de veras te lo digo. No, I'm not making fun of you. Gerinaldo, I mean it. So midnight comes and midnight goes and he's not there. And she says, Malaya tu Gerinaldo, que en amor puso contigo. Cursed be the one who falls in love with you, Gerinaldo dude. And at this very minute, he comes up, and the ballad kind of fast forwards to the king finds them lying together, like mujer y marido, like wife and husband. And so there's different endings. Got you to this suspense. Should I tell you the end at the end of the talk, or should I tell you now? <laughs> um, so uh, in the really old version, the old non-Jewish Spanish version, the version, the original one that was sung in Spain, and is still sung, sung in Spain and Portugal and that the Jews learned it from. The king doesn't say anything. He puts his sword between the two so that they know when they wake up in the morning that he saw them. And in the morning they wake up and she says, oh my God, like my father's been here now, what? And he says, I'm out of here, I'm bouncing. And he jumps out the window. I mean, he literally bounces. And the king who has been expecting this goes out to the garden to find him and says, oh, Gerinaldo, what are you doing out here in the garden so early in the morning? Oh, I came to smell the flowers. No, 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 it's okay, I know what you're doing here, but you know what, you're a good man, you're a great page, you've served me really well, I'm gonna marry you to my daughter, and you can have half my kingdom and the rest when I die. And Gerinaldo says, sorry, king, but I swore an oath to the virgin that I will only marry a virgin, and thanks to my tender ministrations, your daughter isn't one anymore. However, the Jewish version, <laughs> the Moroccan Jewish version, uh, the king says, Que haré de mi paisano, que haré de mi mesquino. He says, what am I going to do? If I king kill Gerinaldo, I've lost a really, really good page who's going to grow up and be a soldier and be somebody who really helps me keep my kingdom going. And if I kill my daughter, well, I've killed my daughter. I don't want to kill my daughter. So I guess I'm going to have to marry them to each other. And the next day, the wedding is celebrated. So there's an expression among the Moroccan Jews that says, may you have the luck, the mazal, of Gerineldo. And that's why we took that name, Gerineldo. But I used to actually get letters back in the day when people wrote you know, letters with envelopes. Mr. Jerry Neldo. Dear Mr. Neldo, we are interested in a concert. You know. <laughs> so we performed for many, many years together, including last time I was here at the Alliance Francaise. Uh, Back and forth between Morocco and Montreal. So I was privileged to study oud um, with the, you can see the oud here, with the great Sami al-Maghribi, Salomon Amzalag, after hearing him perform at this concert here, in this uh, building here in uh, Concordia University, uh, in, oh, 1970, in, when did I hear him? 79, I think. 
So I just went up to him afterwards and I said, est-ce que je peux étudier le oud avec vous? Like I just, I didn't know how famous he was. I said, can I go study the oud with you? And he said, yeah, sure. And didn't tell me how famous he was. I found that out later. So he actually was a favorite uh, singer of the King of Morocco. He's still a favorite, he, till he died, he was a favorite singer of the King of Morocco. He brought his children up to sing. He sang in Hebrew, Arabic, Judeo, Spanish, French. He wrote songs. And um, this is actually Sami singing his well-known song in Arabic um, called New York. America is like the best place to be. So here is a Moroccan Jewish man who grew up in Morocco, lived in Paris, came to Canada, spent his last years in between Montreal and Jerusalem, and wrote about, in Arabic, about how much fun it was to go to New York. Can we have that sound clip? Again? New York, blad al khir wal mal. This is the end of the song. <laughs> So he was a synagogue singer, a liturgical singer, but he also wrote songs like this. Uh, these are just scenes uh, mostly in Morocco. Uh, so this was the night honoring Samuel Maghribi in Montreal. And this is actually a Moroccan Muslim musician, uh, Khalil Mokadem, who I believe has played here. Charlie Edri, who is a Jewish Moroccan musician. And really, this is still how things work in Morocco even today. It's wonderful. Uh, I was at a wedding in Morocco, and the women dressed me up in this dress. And then they told me to just keep it. And so I showed it to my daughter, who's performed here many times at Aga Khan. And she said, oh, thanks for giving this to me, mom, and walked away with it. This is the street that I was living on when I was invited to perform in that uh, festival and bring Jewish songs back to Muslim La Rache. And I actually was on my way to sing. Uh, when I passed these Gnawa musicians at the top of the street and I was almost late to my own concert because I was so fascinated by them and I couldn't tear myself away. Uh, this is the remains of the synagogue of Qasar al-Kibir, Al-Qasar kibir As you can see, there's no Jews living there and they've sort of let it grow over. But the man, the Muslim man who was the caretaker, came out to meet me and, and show me around what was left of the ruins and say that he still keeps it clean and you know, cleans any animal waste or garbage away from it out of respect, even though there's no one using it there anymore. And you can see this is a street in Tangier called Synagogue Street, Synagogue. Uh, this is what was the um, family of Hannah Pimienta, the woman who sang me so many songs in that bingo picture. And this was my daughter Tamar, who when she was only eight, as they dressed her up uh, as, a, as a bride in their house. Okay, um, this is the same group I was telling you about Girinaldo and or Girinaldo and some of the bridges. This is a Moroccan Muslim group that was brought over by the Moroccan embassy in Ottawa one year and we did a joint concert with them. This is from our musical, which was financed by the Canada Council and we actually never got to put out in digital form because we did it all back when it was VHS, believe it or not. Um, and you can see the similarities here. So here is Jumol Lederi, one of the women at the Sephardic Golden Age bingo game, playing her tambourine. And here is in Larache, Morocco, is the Muslim women Sufi group that I worked with for the concert, playing frame drums and singing a lot of the same rhythms. They were singing in Arabic, of course. And, but we did the concert together, as you can see. So the way it worked is I did the first part, all Moroccan Jewish women songs. We did a second part all together, where I taught them some songs and they taught me some things. And then the third part they did of Moroccan Muslim Sufi repertoire. And where we did it was in the last Catholic church that is still functioning in the town from the, when the Spaniards uh, were running it under the protectorate. So it was very, very moving. There were people in the audience, older people crying because they remembered when everybody did live there and basically got along. It wasn't perfect, things are never perfect, but it was pretty good. It was really pretty good. Um, at the end of Passover, 
when you, you know, probably many of you know that you don't eat, if you're an Orthodox or an observant Jew, you don't eat uh, leavened bread for eight days. You only eat flat bread or matzah. So at the end of Passover in Morocco, they have a celebration called Mimuna, which has now become pretty widespread. And it's to celebrate being able to have yeast and leavened things again. So you have a table with everything that rises, whether it's bread or not. And traditionally, and it happened that night, this is in Morocco in uh, 92. That night, it happened, same thing happened. Muslim neighbors very often went to the house and brought fresh bread because the woman of the house wouldn't have had time to bake bread while the Passover uh, eight days were still on. And it ended at sundown, but she wouldn't have had time to bake bread between then and sundown. So very, very often a Muslim neighbor would actually take it upon himself or herself to bring bread and then they would stay and sing and eat with the family. And this is, I don't know if this will work, we can see if it does. This is um, Girinaldo, our last concert all together before Soli Levi became ill, so unfortunately he can't sing. And this is all our generations together. So Oro, who actually found the group, Dr. Oro Anori Librovich, Soli Levi, who lives here in Toronto, um, my daughter, Tamar Ilana, that some of you have heard, myself, Dimitros Petzalakis, who has performed here also many times, and Sali's grandson, Matan Boker. So we have actually three generations and, and uh, a mixture of people. So this is a paraliturgical song, and it's an alphabet acrostic. And the, uh, the mannequin at the left is wearing a wedding dress made by Susie Benchimo. because it goes on for a while. Thanks. So it's an alphabetic acrostic, and it's just glorifying the name of God by the alphabet. So there is nobody like him, and then it goes right through the Hebrew alphabet in order. That's why I stopped it, because it can kind of go on for a while. So migrating customs. Here we have Moroccan Jewish weddings in Montreal and Toronto in the 80s and 90s, and Muslim Moroccan weddings in Morocco in uh, 2013 and 14. So what happened is, um, I've been to Morocco many times before that. I was at a wedding way back in 1972. And I didn't have it, I mean, nobody had a video camera. There weren't, you know, little tiny video cameras in 1972. And I didn't even have a camera camera with me. And it was by sheer chance, I was in this town, it was in Wazan, and uh, I heard the sound of all these shams and you know drums and people going by and I, there was a young guy standing around and I said to him in French, what's happening? He said, oh, it's a wedding, you wanna come? And I said, sure. He said, okay, I'll, I'll go grab a kaftan from my sister. And he gave me a kaftan, put it on, he said, put the hood up and keep your mouth shut so they don't know that you're you know, not from the wedding party and not from here. And just, well, So it was great. And I recorded a little bit of it actually on a cassette player that I had, but I don't have any photos. But you can see things are really, very similar, so you paint your hands with henna, that's my hand that people, that she, this woman painted, I took the picture with my other hand, actually, as she was doing the henna on this hand. And here another woman is putting henna on the foot of uh, which bride, I don't think it's the bride, it's, I think it's this bride, uh, on her foot. And here in Toronto, my friend and colleague, Noam Sienna, is putting henna on my daughter's hand for the concert that you just saw a little bit of. So nothing's changed. You, now you can get you know books of henna designs, just like wallpaper designs or linoleum designs, and and choose them. But other than that, it's the same. The, this is the bride in 2013 in, in the town of La Rache. You can see the bride under the veil, and her hands are hennaed. And later on, her brother came and carried her out on his back because the bottoms of her feet were hennaed and they hadn't quite dried yet, so they didn't want to wreck it. And those are her, you know, the little girls carrying the candles and so on. This is the throne that you put the bride and the groom on at the end. 
This is in Morocco, and this is in Montreal at a real Moroccan Jewish wedding that they invited the entire community to as well as part of a Sephardic week, but they really were just getting married. And here is also the Moroccan wedding in Toronto. So you can see the setup is really exactly the same. They pick them up and carry them either just through the hall, which is what happened at this wedding, or right through the streets, which is much more traditional and, and I saw as well. Same thing, this is in Toronto. They pick up the bride and carry her on the platform through and everybody's throwing you know, little conf confetti and flowers and rice and singing and doing the barwala, the yoo 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 all this kind of thing. It's exactly the same. Now, what's this cow doing here? <laughs> um, and what am I doing with the cow in my video camera? So this is La Rache, Morocco. And in 2014, I said to my friends there, to my Muslim friends there, you know, there's an old song I think we can hear it here, if we try out the song at the bottom right. Okay, thanks. So it says we're bringing the cow and she's all dressed up and her horns are all decorated. And I didn't know, I just heard the song in an archive, in an old arc, sand archive in Jerusalem. So I said to my Muslim friends, I heard, you know, that in a Sephardic wedding here in Larache, in this whole area, they would bring a cow out and decorate the cow and, and parade her through the streets before slaughtering the cow for the banquet, for the wedding banquet. Is that a custom that's here? And instead of answering me directly, my friend Mohammed and his wife Fatima Zohra said, well, um, 11 o'clock tomorrow morning, go to the corner of the street and this street and bring your video camera. And that's what was on the corner at 11 o'clock the next morning. It wasn't an extremely wealthy wedding, so it was just a little cow. <laughs> And they paraded, I have a lot of video of this, they paraded her right through the streets and they were the big, long, one-note trumpets and the shams and the percussion and the big drums and little kids dancing in the street and everybody's all dressed up and so on and so forth. And then they actually did slaughter the cow. And uh, that night, it was part of the wedding feast. It was very quick, just so you know. Um, and then these songs up here, I can't even remember which songs I put up, but they're relevant, so if we can just hear a little bit of each of them in order. Ah, that's for the henna. So that I recorded here, right here. So this is a traditional northern Moroccan Muslim henna song that they sing traditionally while the bride's hands are being henna. And they were very gracious. They let me record and also videotape everything, and they didn't even really know me, so I was very touched. Can we do the next one? Ah, so this is the, the Sephardic Jewish, that's Sali Levi that you saw in the video singing. And it says, give us the bride. If you don't give us a bride now, we'll have recourse to the law. And then they sing this song. But everybody is going to sing it together. Okay, so we can stop that and I'll tell you a little bit about it. So this is traditional. When they took the bride through the streets, her, um, her parents, or if she didn't have parents, you know, brothers, guardians, aunts, uncle, they would guide her by the elbows so that she could still look down modestly. And she was wearing, of course, all this really heavy, you know, velvet and gold embroidered thread and this huge headdress and so on, very, very elaborate and jewels. And she'd be looking down for the reasons I told you before. So her parents would guide her and they'd be holding a candle, beautiful candlestick in the other hand, if you can envision this. And then when they got to the groom's house, and it was the same procession, same type of procession as the Muslims do, they would stop and the groom would come out, the groom's family would come out and say, give us the bride. So that's what the groom would sing. And then everybody would sing together, oh, beautiful gazelle, which is the song that Sali started to sing afterwards. If there were, I don't know, are there any Moroccan Jews in the room here? 
Did you not want to start singing that right away, or are you younger? <laughs> Maybe you're too young to know that you're supposed to start singing. If it had been your parents, or Susie and Jack Benchy Mole, they would, they would still be singing it now. I wouldn't have been talking. We'd just probably stop the whole thing and sing it. <laughs> OK. Uh, next. That's the thing about pictures. They have all these stories. Can we have the next slide? OK, back to uh, a bunch of words. Sorry. <laughs> Um, I should probably do a couple of wedding songs for you, though. So typically, the wedding songs are a mixture of quite poetic and quite practical. So there's one, for example, where she says, when I was a young girl, unmarried girl in my father's house, I spent a lot of time in front of the mirror and combing my beautiful hair. And now, as a married woman, and you think she's going to say something like, I rock my baby, or I attend to my husband's needs, or something, and she says, I spend the same time looking in my husband's wallet. But then she goes right into, in the next verse, um, life is now beautiful and one should praise God for creating us and for giving us these ha this happiness. So it's a really, you know, curious mixture. And a lot of these songs were also sung only among women or only among men. So I actually don't know what the songs were only among men, I can imagine. But the songs among women were often quite explicit. So you might say things like... Um, <clears throat> Yansi se marimo y hacia la cama. Adela nuestra novia será de galana. Adela nuestra novia será galana y será galana. Yansi se marimo y hacia la cama. Wa la la, wa jinin handi, wa jinin handi. Wa al khorsa, wa al khal khal, wa jira al takri. So it goes on, but basically it says, they got me ready for the bed, says the bride and they checked to see that I was still a virgin. And then they also sing songs that tell the bride in kind of allusions, you know, veiled allusions, kind of what she can expect in the marriage. And, you know, some of them, again, are very, very light, you know, make sure he gives you nice shoes and nice clothes to wear. And some of them are a little bit more specific about what she's going to have to do as an innocent young virgin who's never done this before, uh, they hoped, and usually was the case. Uh, and so on. So there's a lot of really, really happy wedding songs. And usually what would happen is one woman would start, she'd be the woman who knew the most songs, not necessarily with the best voice. That helped, but not necessarily. But who knew the most songs and who could keep going with them the longest time. So when I was actually at that wedding in Toronto that I showed you, um, I was kind of frustrated because they weren't singing these wedding songs. They were singing, you know, popular Israeli songs, popular Arabic songs, popular French songs. They were even singing like Jacques Brel. And finally, the wife's, the bride's mother said to me, can you just sing something traditional? And I picked up my drum and started singing, and all the women said, no, not like that. And as an ethnomusicologist, that's the best thing I could have heard. I just said, oh, how then? And handed over my drum, and they all started singing. It was wonderful. It was just great. So this is a little bit more serious. Uh, scholars of Sephardic ballad studies have written about the phenomenon of de-Christianization. So most of these ballads were from, go back to medieval or early Renaissance Spain. Not early medieval, but Renaissance Spain. Um, and they learned them as they were, but in some cases, not all cases. Remember the case of Gerdinaldo, where they adjusted that violent ending to be an okay ending? So they did some of that, but in some cases, they also took Christian references out and just automatically replaced them with something that had the same rhyme or assonance and the same metrical scheme. So scholars have written a lot about that. Um, in Gerinaldo, in our group in the 1980s, our singer Kelly spontaneously changed the phrase in one ballad, which was, con Jesucristo y con mi madre, I want to give birth in the presence of Jesus Christ and my mother. And she changed that automatically to con mi padre y con mi madre, and just sang that you know, automatically. She didn't even think twice about it. And she was pretty young at the time. I think at that time, Kelly couldn't have been more than in her 40s, you know, she wasn't an 85-year-old woman thinking of generations earlier. She just did it automatically. But they don't all. And the 19th century Moroccan Sephardic ballad of Sol Hatruel is a true story. It's about a young Jewish girl. Um, she wasn't actually from Fez. She was from Tangier or Tetuan, but this happened in Fez. She was beheaded in 1834 for refusing to convert to Islam and join the governor's harem. And even her parents and her rabbi told her to go ahead to convert because you know it was under pain of death and life mattered. And she said, no, she wouldn't. And so she actually was beheaded. And they made songs and stories and plays and so on about her. And her tomb 
is right here in Fez, in the Jewish cemetery of Fez. It's very, very well kept. And many people go, you can see that it's got windows carved in the back. And on the bottom of the floor, you often see candles like burned out, um, you know, candles that people have brought as offerings. And these are just some, um, uh, you know, imaginary portraits of her. And the song is actually not only well known among Moroccan and Sephardic Jews, the tomb is frequently visited by Muslims as well as Jews because visiting the tomb of someone venerated was actually a custom shared, is actually a custom shared by Muslims and Jews. We can hear a little bit of the ballad here as sung by Jerry Rinaldo, by Kelly in our group. <laughs> Sentenciaron a la hermosa sol y la hicieron juramento falso en presencia del gobernador. Okay. So this is getting toward the end here. The Hilula uh, is a visit to the tomb of a revered rabbi or righteous person, and it's the same in Muslim culture, it's a visit to the tomb of a Muslim saint, someone venerated. And usually, well now, they often do it, you know, by chartered bus. <laughs> but back in the day, you tried to do it on foot, you tr you'd even, or donkey if necessary, or horse, because it usually wasn't gonna be very far away from you lived. There were so many local saints and local venerated rabbis that usually it wasn't gonna be more than, say, 30 kilometers. So you tried to either do it by foot or on horseback or donkey or whatever was available or an old rickety bus in the early 20th century. So the same woman, uh, Julia Ederi, the one you saw her picture with the tambourine, the same woman who told me about um, many, many other things also, uh, she told me about the cow and the cow song and you know all that kind of stuff. She also told me that when she went on a pilgrimage to, um, I don't think I have the picture. Yes, to the upper right. When she went on, oops, sorry, I've got to go back here. When she went on a pilgrimage here to Wazan, to the tomb of um, Amran ben Diwan, to ask for a child because she was barren. So she told me this was, she was in her 80s when she told me this, and this was in the 80s. So, you know, she was born in the very beginning of the 20th century. And uh, she said she was married off by her parents to a man who was nice, but he was really very old. So she was 17. So he must have been really old, you know, at least 30, 31. And she says, you know, he was all right, he was good to me, but he was just so old and, and so, you know, ugly that I couldn't bring myself, well, you know, I, I, like, I couldn't bring myself to do it. She said, and so, but I got worried because I wasn't having, I wasn't getting pregnant. I'm thinking, wait, <laughs> isn't there like a connection here? Maybe they didn't sing her the right songs at the wedding. And she said, so after a year, my mother and I went on a pilgrimage to the tomb of Rabbi Amran ben Diwan, because he is the rabbi whose spirit is considered to be helpful to women who are looking to have a child. And she recounts all these classic standard miracles, you know, it rains everywhere, but it doesn't rain right over his tomb, and so on and so forth. And he appears to her in a dream that night, and he says, my daughter, go home and just resume normal relations with your husband, and within a year, you should be thanking me for your baby. And so she said, and I went home, and I did, and it all worked out. And I thought, well, it's kind of a boring story, but whatever, okay. And I smiled. And I packed up my, at the time, really heavy reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, which is what the university made us use. And uh, it was winter, it was like this time of year, and it was Montreal, and I put on 25 layers of clothing. It wasn't like you could just take out your cell phone and say, let me record that, you know? Because as I was walking out the door with everything packed up, she said, you know, it's such a coincidence. C'était vraiment une coincidence. All that time, you know, I was married and nothing happened, and I went and talked to the rabbi, and he said to take up relations with my husband, and I did, and what a coincidence, you know? Nine months later, my son was born. And I couldn't tape it because everything was all packed up. So there's a, a great song. I thought I'd put it up here, but I didn't. So what you hear, see here is um, usually it's men, but there's two exceptions among the Jews. It's Sol Hachuel or Solika, the woman I told you about who was beheaded. And among the Muslims, it's Lala Menana, who is the patron saint of Larach, the same town that I spend so much time in. And you can see that this is actually a, a painting of her shrine, of the shrine to her and her tomb. 
but everything. This is cafe la la manana, this is parking la la manana, this is cafe la la manana, patisserie, bakery la la manana, and this group of women that I was singing with in, the, in that very moving concert, they're also called Ensemble la la manana, and they're not the only ones. There's other groups called that too, so. Um, the Hilulu, the Hilulu song in uh, Hebrew lists all the, the rabbis of the different towns. So it says, where are you going, Mr. Yitzhak, Mr. Isaac? And he answers and he says, I'm going to such and such a town to pray at the tomb of Rabbi so-and-so. And it just goes on and on and on naming towns and rabbis. So when I was setting up this concert with them, I made a list of towns that were nearby that they could sing with me because it's the same tune and the same rhythm as songs that they sing. And I wasn't sure of the rabbis of those particular towns. So I went to the Hajj, to the Muslim Hajj of the town who had been to Mecca and back and was known for his good works and for helping poor people have weddings that they all otherwise couldn't afford. And he also is a tailor and he does, and this is irrelevant to the music, but it's kind of irresistible. He's a very good looking man and a wonderful tailor. And his own advertising is to make new jalabas and kaftans and then wear them himself around the town and invite people to mint tea. And then they say, oh, what a beautiful, he only makes men's clothes. And the men will say, what a beautiful new uh, kaftan or jalaba you have. And he says, oh, would you like to order one? <laughs> but really, his, he doesn't travel. He stays in the town, and he uses his extra money, really, to help people out. And so I went to him, and I said, do you know the names of the rabbis from Ksar al-Kibir and from Larache and from Arzila? And so on. he said, oh, yeah, sure, come on in, have some tea, and uh, write down the names of the rabbis. So again, that was just, you know, classic. And the song goes like this. So <clears throat> the first person is saying, where are you going, Mr. Isaac? And he's saying, I'm going to, name of town, to pray at the tune of Rabbi so-and-so. And then at the very end, he says, um, not very, in a not very feminist manner, but most folk songs aren't, he says, all right, I'm tired, I'm done, where's my wife, come make my bed. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just a messenger. Donde vais, a donde vais, señor Yitzhak? Que mos vamos, que mos vamos para Tanja, para zorear, para zorear, a repi mordeja y benjo. Su nembración, su nembración, que mos sirva de bendición. So that's, you know, one, uh, one town, one rabbi, and at the very end he says, uh, Hazme la cama que me quiero recoger, que vengo cansada y no está aquí mi mujer. A few songs, just a few that you didn't hear. So, um, Landarico, which goes back to a Merovingian chronicle. Merovingian dynasty was the 6th century, so the song isn't that old by any means, but the story is, and it's been circulating in various forms, in the ballad form, since the very late Middle Ages or early Renaissance, I will not, if there are scholars in the room, I will not say early modern. I just refuse to believe that people got up one day in the Renaissance and said, oh, cool dudes, it's early modern times. It's just such a, I mean, you could have a Renaissance festival, but like really, are you gonna have an early modern fair? Like it's medieval times, early modern times? It doesn't work, it doesn't work. So uh, anyway, the. Song doesn't circulate outside Spanish and Portuguese speaking areas. A lot of ballads do. They circulate right through Europe and further. But this one doesn't. And um, basically, the king gets up one Monday morning and he goes to see his wife to see how she's faring before he goes out hunting. He, you know, he goes to say hello, dear, and she's braiding or unbraiding her hair or whatever in front of her mirror. And he pokes her in the back with his golden rod, which is one of my, I repeat this all the time, but it's one of my favorite lines in balladry. And she doesn't know whose golden rod it is because she's too busy looking in, I guess, a very little mirror, not big enough to see him. And she assumes it's her lover, Landarico. And so she says, oh, uh, Landarico, Landarico, my beautiful, handsome, gorgeous lover, I have three kids with you and only one with the king. Sometimes she says two and two. And then she starts listing all the good stuff that she gives his children and all the not so good stuff that the king's kid gets, you know. And then she turns her head around. Okay. Um, Levantóse el rey a casar un lunes por la mañana y fue a ver a la reina por ver cómo alboreaban. So on. So this is the kind of song you sing slowly while you're 
working in the kitchen or mending or sewing and so forth. So uh, what happens when he finds out? Because what happens is she turns around and sees the king and says, oops. So we'll, I'll tell you the ending some other time, you know, because we're kind of running short of time. Um, the Husband's Return is um, a pan-European ballad, on the other hand, which is sung in many different languages. So he goes away for seven years, of course, because you never go away for six or eight years. You go away for seven years, he comes back, and he tries to trick her. He says, oh, hello, can I have a glass of water or wine or whatever? And she says, uh, sure, where are you coming from? Oh, I'm coming from the wars of so-and-so. Really, did you see my husband? What did he look like? Well, he was tall, and he was gorgeous, and he was perfect, and so on and so forth. Oh, yeah, I saw him. He was dying, and he told me to marry you. Um, anyone grow up here listening to Joan Baez? Joan Baez's first album, Very Young Maid All in the Garden. That's one of the English versions. So she says, <clears throat> oh, no, no kind, sir, I cannot marry thee, for I have a love who sails all on the sea, right? So it's sung in, in uh, Sephardic versions and French versions and uh, Greek versions and so on and so forth. <clears throat> um, weddings, you've heard some. Hilula, calendar cycle, Purim is coming up, the Jewish holiday of Purim, the book of Esther. And they sing a lot of songs related to that. Um, one of the classic Moroccan ones is um, Empezar quiero contar Hechas de Dios alto y de lo que voy a mentar Nada yo no falto Con risos y cantos Y con gran placer Porque aman el mamzer Mosquizo mercarmos También a temarmos And so on. But I'm going to end with this song that gave the title to this presentation because months ago when they asked me for a title, I tried to think of one. I'm terrible at titles. So I said, how about Underneath the Lemon Tree? And they said, okay, so that's the title of the presentation. <clears throat> it's an old parallel structure. Under the lemon tree, the bride, her feet in the clear water, her love passed by. What are you doing, my beautiful bride? I'm waiting for you. Um, what are you doing, my beautiful bride? Again, I'm waiting for you, but in different ways that rhyme in different ways. And oh yes, the one I put above, um, <clears throat> which actually has a YouTube link, but I'll, you can find it and I'll just sing it for you a little bit, is a modern song, 1930s. And it's based on a Spanish modern song during the Protectorate. And the Jews of Tangier used to sing it, only Tangier. And it, was, it talks about the custom in Spain, too, of the young girls walking out and the young boys on the boulevard in the first cool of the evening. So, you know, 7 o'clock, whatever, in the evening. And uh, chaperoned usually by friends or parents, but kind of looking at each other to see who might look interesting. And the guy says, um, I look at all these girls and their waists are small like like you know, the waste of bugs, and their eyes are bright like the new neon lights that have come out all over the place. And uh, I'd give my life for you and to go off and do what Hasim and his new girlfriend and new wife are doing. <laughs> En estos bulevares de siete a ocho se quebran las algas, vas buscando a novio. Me vaya acá para agua, me vaya a jalala. Así va con Nisim, se fueron a fugrear. So it's a mixture of Chaketia, Judeo Spanish, and bits of Hebrew and bits of Arabic all thrown in together. And the last one I'll just do for you, and you can follow the words The Bride Under the Lemon Tree. <coughs> Debajo del limón la novia, sus pies en el agua clara, su amor por ahí pasará. Que así es mi novia galana, esperando a vos mi alma. Debajo del limón la novia, sus pies en el agua fría, su amor por ahí venía. Que así es mi novia garrida, esperando a vos mi vida. Debajo del limón la novia. So that's basically it for today.